All right, so as you all know, or those who have been following along here at our church, we've been going through the book of Matthew. And we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 27, in which we will be looking at uh, the crucifixion of Christ. We've already seen that Christ had been condemned by the chief priests and elders, uh, falsely accused, also forced to testify against himself, but was condemned and sent to Pilate, who reluctantly gave Jesus over to the crowd to be crucified. And as we think about this scenario and the things that are about to take place, which find themselves in a place in history, in human history, we might begin to just focus on what's going on and, and forget the reason why all these things are taking place. We're, we're about to get into his, uh, them mocking him, him being led to the cross, being uh, hung on the cross. Why is it that all this took place? And, and just for a moment, a brief moment, I want to take us back so that we realize why it is all this is taking place. If you flip in your Bible way back to the left, all the way to Genesis, in, in chapter 3, we see the reason why Jesus is having to go through all this. If you remember, God had created the world. It was beautiful. It was just the way he liked it. Uh, he said it was good. He made man on the sixth day. He said it was very good. Placed man in a garden, uh, more accurately translated, a grove, which was a grove of trees. And amongst all these trees, in the middle of it was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. But God said very poignantly, and very clearly, you shall not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The day that you eat of it, you will surely die. You see, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil represented God's moral law. His, his understanding of what is right and wrong, what is good and evil. And God said, you can't handle that. You can't handle knowing between good and evil. Because then you will be responsible for your actions. And none of us can live up to that. As Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The flesh cannot take in the law. It's built for survival, uh, self-exaltation, self-preservation, self-gratification. The flesh is all about survival and promoting self. The law is founded in love, which does what? Often calls us to self-humiliation, to self-sacrifice and to uh, giving of self to others, which often, oftentimes conflict. And so our flesh wants us to live for self. The law says live for others, live for God. And God saw that this was going to be a problem for them. So he said, don't even touch the fruit. Well, the serpent came. We find out later in Revelation 12 that this is the serpent of old, the devil. And he comes to the woman and says, did the Lord say you cannot eat of any of the trees of the garden? And she said, well, of all the trees we may freely eat, but of the tree that is in the center of the garden, God said, you shall not eat it nor touch it. And the day that you do so, you will die. And the serpent very craftily and very deceitfully said, you will not surely die. For the Lord knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like him, knowing between good and evil. The serpent never tells her to eat the fruit. He just basically just questions what God says. And questions God's motives in saying what he said. Well, she looks up at the tree. She saw that the fruit was a delight to the eyes. It was good for food. And it was good for making someone wise. And she took of the fruit, ate of it, gave it to her husband, and he ate of it. And immediately they knew they were naked. Why is that? Well, because law always exposes the flesh for what it is. When God brings in his law, it shows the weakness of the flesh, the shame in the flesh, and therefore they realized that they were naked. And they began to try to cover themselves with fig leaves. As we typically try to do whenever we do something that exposes us. We want to cover ourselves. And they do that. And God is coming in the, or came in the uh, cool of the day. And he's looking for Adam. And, and, Adam said, and, and he questions him, you know, where are you? He's like, well, I hid myself. because." And God said, why did you hide yourself? Because I knew that I was naked. Who told you you were naked? Did you eat of the tree that I told you not to eat of? And Adam says, the woman that you gave me, she gave it to me, and I ate. And then the Lord looks to the woman. The woman says, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. Well, because all three of these people were, uh, you know, guilty, God puts a curse on each one of them. 
to the serpent, he says, to, to the, to, on your belly you shall go and eat dust all the days of your life. And y'all put enmity between your seed and the woman's seed. You will crush his heel. I mean, you will bruise his heel, but he will crush your head. That was the curse on the serpent. And then he turns to the woman. He says, you know, uh, I will increase your pain in childbearing. And your desire will be for your husband, but he will rule over you. Basically, you're going to have pain, increased pain, but also you're going to be subjected to your husband. Uh, oftentimes against your own desire. But then he turns to the man, and he tells, says to the man, he says, uh, by the sweat of the brow, of your brow, you will bring forth food. And he, and he brought thorns and thistles from the ground. And he told him that from dust you have came, and to dust you shall return. You're going to die, Adam. You're going to have physically death. Physical death. They had already been spiritually dead because they sinned against God. But also physical death was going to be tied to that. So as we think about this, you say, well, why are you bringing this up when we're studying Jesus' crucifixion in Matthew chapter 27? we got to see the tie. This is why Jesus is going through what he's going through. In a garden, there was sin. There was rebellion against God. In the garden of Eden, in the garden of Gethsemane, Jesus sweat drops of blood and anguish and agony over thinking about what he was about to accomplish. In the Garden of Eden, there was a tree, a tree of the knowledge of good and evil that brought condemnation on people. On Calvary, there was a tree that we call the cross. And on the cross, as Colossians chapter 2 teaches us, the law was nailed and put away so that the debt incurred to us by the law would be taken away and we'd be brought from death into life. One garden and a tree led to condemnation and death, the other to righteousness and life. But even when you look in the more in the weeds, if you will, of the story of these different curses, though they seem very random, we find that, and we'll find this as we go through Matthew chapter 27. And hopefully we can point these out as we go along. But I want to give them to you all at once so that we don't miss anything and you see it all tied together. As you look at each of these curses, Jesus took on each one of these curses. The serpent, there was enmity between his seed and, that is, the serpent seed and the woman's seed. There would always be enmity between Christ and Satan. Christ was the seed of the woman, born of a virgin, the Holy Spirit overshadowing Mary, and bringing forth a child, being of the seed of woman. He was then an enmity with the serpent. We see that in Matthew chapter 4 with the temptations when Satan comes to try to tempt him. That, that whole uh, battle that goes on, a uh, spiritual battle that goes on between him and Satan. But we find in Matthew chapter 27 the bruising of the heel of the seed of the woman. We find him being bruised very much. As a matter of fact, this first story that we talk about with the Roman cohort around him, mocking him, beating him, spitting on him. We think it's just the Roman cohort doing it. Or we just think it was the Sanhedrin who was doing it earlier. But behind the scenes, behind what was going on, was this dark spiritual forces of wickedness that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 that was bruising the heel of the seed of the woman. But you know what? The serpent's head will be crushed soon, and we'll, we'll study that as we get to it. Then you think about the pain of the woman in childbearing. Increased pain in childbirth. Why is that? Well, it was through childbirth that the Savior would come. And so her pain must be, uh, I'm sorry, must be connected to the childbearing. As he would have to suffer immensely, and we'll talk about that here in a moment. As he put, took on the full suffering that sin took, so the woman would then have to have increased pain in childbearing. But he took on that suffering, that pain. Throughout scriptures, whenever the Lord is talking to someone about suffering, usually, or a lot of times, the analogy of childbirth, the pains of childbirth, is mentioned a lot of times. And so there's a connection between childbirth and suffering. Jesus took on the full suffering. So that was taken care of through Jesus Christ. And then the fact of, uh, that she had to be subjected to her husband. Her desire would be for her husband, but he would master over her, rule over her. Christ, the King of glory, the one who was sitting at the, in glory with the Father from eternity past, came down to the earth in humanity 
became like a servant, subjected himself to a band of soldiers, one governor, a group of chief priests and, and uh, elders who were wicked and corrupt. He had to subject himself to that. So he too had to learn how to submit to uh, wicked people. Uh, very difficult thing to do. But then you talk about the man, talking about the sweat of the brow, laboring to bring up fruit from the ground. Christ too, bearing his own cross. You can just imagine the sweat pouring over his face, trickling over his brow as he's bearing his cross, leading it up to Calvary, carrying the burden, the shoulder of our sins on his back, laboring hard in order for us to find rest. And then you think about the thorns that grew up from the ground. What did they put on his head? They came and they weaved together this crown of thorns and they put it on his head. Thorns now forever represent sin, remind us of sin. As we look at thorns as you're going through, you know, I remember going rabbit hunting with my dad when I was a kid, going through the briars and getting all cut up. That's a reminder of the sin that happened in the garden. But Christ bore that on his head, putting the crown of thorns on his head. And then finally that being put to death, uh, from dust you shall return. Christ ultimately bore the death, the curse of death on the cross for us. Even the shame that came from the sin, right? The nakedness, we'll talk about that here in a moment too. Stripped of his clothing, hung on the cross, naked, open, exposed to everyone. And everything that happened in Genesis chapter 3 of a negative sort, Jesus took it on himself. And so we cannot read, or we should not read, Matthew 27 without remembering Genesis chapter 3. It's all interconnected. It's all brought together. So hopefully we can kind of think about that and also maybe make those connections as we're going through our story. But now as we go back to Matthew chapter 27, we find ourselves in verse 27, where all these things are about to take place. Again, Jesus now has been condemned by the ecclesiastical courts, uh, which was made up of the chief priests and elders. He's also been condemned by the civil court, uh, by Pilate, even though he did it reluctantly. And now there's nothing left for him to do but to be let out and be crucified after being mocked by the soldiers. So in verse 27 it says, Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole Roman cohort around him. Uh, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hell, King of the Jews! They spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they had mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put his own garments back on him and led him away to be or to crucify him. So they take him out to this praetorium. The praetorium was basically just the governor's residence. Okay. Most likely there's probably already soldiers gathered there. They take him there to this Roman cohort. A cohort was, just means like a group of people. Uh, if you're looking at it in a technical sense in, in the Roman military terminology, depending on what's going on, if they're in battle or something else is going on, it could range anywhere from 400 soldiers up to 1,000 soldiers. So, but it was seen as just a fraction of the legion, which was made up of 6,000. Nonetheless, this could have been a very large crowd of soldiers. Uh, more than probably what we picture when we think about this scenario. But anyways, Jesus finds himself there in the midst of a cruel, brutal soldier cohort. These people surrounding him. If he turns to the right, there's people spitting at him. If he turns to the left, there's people beating him. He tries to go forward, there's people mocking him. He looks back and there's people who want to take over him. Everywhere he turns, he finds nothing but suffering, trials, afflictions, and pain. Have you ever felt that way before in your life? You ever felt surrounded? If I turn to my finances, I see nothing but pain. If I turn to my marriage, I see nothing but conflict. If I turn to my job, I see nothing but politics and difficulty there. Everywhere I turn in my life, I feel surrounded. Nowhere to turn, nowhere to find relief. Nowhere to say, ah, finally, I'm, I'm, I'm out, of the, out of the dark. But just immersed in darkness, immersed in affliction, immersed in trial and difficulty. Maybe you can relate with Jesus in this particular situation. 
If so, we can take some comfort and we can also find some instructions on what to do in those circumstances. Isaiah 50 gives us a little more detail on this uh, situation. In Isaiah chapter 50, there's a phrase in which uh, that is commonly tied to uh, what Jesus is going through here, where they're spitting on him, they're, they're beating him with rods and one what and the other. And it says here in Isaiah chapter 50, in verse 5, it says, The Lord has opened my ear, and I was disobedient. Maybe a, uh, in the original language, there's this idea of the piercing of the ear, the opening of the ear. Maybe alluding to uh, Exodus 21, where it talks about this, the willing slave who allows himself to be pierced with the awl to the doorpost. It's a picture of being obedient to your master. In other words, so the Lord has opened up my ear, and I was not disobedient. I obeyed what he had to say. This is Jesus. He obeyed what his father had planned for him. He said, nor did I turn back. I gave myself, verse 6, to those who strike me, and my cheeks to those who pluck out the beard. I did not cover my face from humiliation and spitting. In other words, I'm here. I'm, I'm right in the middle of it all. I'm surrounded by evil, wicked people, but I'm here obediently. Jesus could very well, and he already said that in the garden, he said, don't you know that I could call 12 legions of angels to come and rescue me? In the center of it all, he could have done the same thing, surrounded by these wicked people. He could have called thousands upon thousands of angels. A legion is 6,000, so 12 times 6,000, I'll let you do the math. But he could have brought down a multitude of angels to come and rescue him. But he obediently endured, kept on going, minute after minute, hour after hour, just enduring the affliction, the trials that were around him. He says, I, don't, I didn't even cover my face in humiliation. In other words, I didn't even try to block or anything like that. Just let him spit on me. Pluck out my beard. Strike me. I'm taking it willingly and obediently to my father. How did he do that? <laughs> How did he endure no friends around him. Nobody patting him on the back of the hand saying, it's going to be okay, Jesus. Nobody coming to bring him a drink of water, do anything for him. He's by himself, segregated from his disciples, his apostles, segregated from all those who were uh, loyal to him, all alone. But yet he's still able to endure this and still be obedient to his father. How did, how did he do it? Well, verse 7 of Isaiah 50 tells us, For the Lord God helps me, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. He could stand firm. He could make his face like flint. I'm not covering my face from the humiliation and the spitting, but my face is like flint. I'm staying put. I'm staying where I'm at. No one can pluck me out of this because I am obedient to my Father, and I put my trust in my Father. When all other things have failed, when all comforts have failed, when I try to find comfort in pleasure or in hobbies or whatever it might be, and all of those things fail, I can put my trust in the Father and remain put and say, I'm not moving. I'm staying right here. My face is like flint. Trusting in the Father allows us to endure it, the darkness, endure the times of hopelessness, the times when we have nowhere else to turn. When we, can't, when we see no hope around us, we see hope above us through our loving Father who reigns over us. Matter of fact, even Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 50, ties this to those who fear the Lord. In verse 10, he says, Who is among you that fears the Lord, that obeys the voice of his servant? That's obedient, just like Christ was obedient. Who? Let's turn now to those who fear the Lord. He says, That walks in darkness and has no light. So now he's addressing those who fear the Lord, who's obeying the Lord, but they find themselves in darkness. There is no light. What should they do? Let him trust in the name of the Lord and rely on his God. You fear the Lord, you're obeying the Lord, but you find yourself in darkness. It says, rely on the name of your God. He's the one that you can trust. He's the one that allows you to endure when everything seems hopeless. It almost seems like Peter has Isaiah 50 in his mind uh, when he makes similar statements in 1 Peter chapter 2. When he says, for you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, and that's what we're reading about in Matthew 27, being reviled, being mocked, 
Oh, here, hell, king of the Jews. They're spitting on him, beating him with the reed. Who being reviled, did not revile in return. While suffering, he had no threats. Didn't say anything. Being beaten, being smitten on, or spit on, and yet he's remaining silent. Why? It says, but he kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. You find yourself in a situation, and in the context here, Peter is writing to people who were suffering for doing what was right. He says, follow Jesus as an example. You want to endure that? You want to make it through that? Trust yourself to him who judges righteously. So as this is going on, it says in verse 28, they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. It's a very interesting study about this robe. Uh, in, other, in other accounts, uh, it, we're told that this was actually a purple robe. So uh, I believe it's the Mark account says that it's a purple robe, but here it says it's a scarlet robe. And some say, well, that's a conflict. Uh, how can they say it's scarlet, but also say that it's purple? Well, most likely this was probably a robe that had both intertwined in it. Um, depending on the lighting, depending on how you're looking, it might have been scarlet. Another one, another way you look, it might have been purple. I mean, think about the shirt I'm wearing now. <laughs> you know, is it blue? Is it red? What, what color is it? Well, it depends on which one you're focusing on. And I think probably this robe they had on had this mixture, which is significant if you're looking at it symbolically. What's going on with Christ here? Purple is a symbol of royalty, right? Purple robes, kings come out in their purple robes. It's always been seen as a symbol of royalty. But at the same time, there's a scarlet mixed in as well. Here, as Christ is being afflicted, while he's being mocked, being called, or being said, hail, king of the Jews, we have a king in his royalty suffering the scarlet redemption blood, shedding the blood. So you have the redemption, which is symbolized by the scarlet, but at the same time, the king represented by the purple, probably uh, done by the father, orchestrated by the father for that purpose. Um, but then it goes in verse 29, and after twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head. We already talked about that. The thorns, the pain that sin causes, thorns cause pain, sin cause pain. Jesus put that on his head, crowned himself with it, or they crowned him with it in mockery. It says, in a reed in his right hand. And they knelt down before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they spat on him and took the reed and began to beat him on the head. After they mocked him, they took the scarlet robe off him and put it on his own garments back on him and led him away to, to crucify him. This is what it meant, really, to be the king. Herod wanted to hold on to that title. Remember at, at the beginning of Matthew, Matthew chapter 2, he didn't like that somebody else was being called king of the Jews. But you want to know what it means to be the king of the Jews, the anointed one, the servant of the Lord? It means suffering. It means mockery. It means being rejected oftentimes. Well, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Then we get to verse 32. I really love verse 32. Um, it says, And as they were coming out, they found a man of Cyrene named Simon, whom they pressed into service to bear his cross. And what I really like is when I cross-reference Mark chapter 15, that says that he was a passerby. I love that. This Simon Cyrene. Cyrene was a, an area north of Africa. He was pretty far away from home. Um, doesn't tell us whether he had moved to Judea and was just living in Judea, or if he made that whole, um, he traveled that whole way just for the Passover. But we do know that's where he was from, originally from. But he's just a passerby, you know? What's going on through his mind? He's walking around. Maybe he's trying to figure out what he's going to do for the Passover. Maybe he's uh, trying to get a bite to eat. It's still morning time. It's uh, before 9 o'clock. Um, who knows what he was about to do? Maybe he was going to see his wife or to do something for his children. Just, just minding his own business. Regular day. Little does he know that he's going to be called upon to bear the cross of the very Messiah that's been promised for thousands of years. His name would forever be remembered. Maybe you can relate to that as well in life. You know, there's some who have grown up knowing the Lord, uh, brought under a Christian home. Always kind of was just expected that you would then put your faith in Christ and follow Him. But then there's some who are just passerbyers. 
These are the people who are doing their own thing, living their life, doing what they wanted to do. Um, God was far from their minds. They had their careers set out. They knew what education they wanted. Uh, they were probably considering who they were going to marry. Who knows? Just going through life, just like everybody else. But before they know it, unexpectedly, the cross of Jesus Christ comes into their vision. And someone says, take up this cross. They are preached the gospel. They are taught the gospel. They learn that there's a person who brought the cross on his own back to die and bear their sins and to bring the forgiveness that would lead to eternal life. And the next thing they know, they're carrying the cross of Christ. They're taking up their cross and following Jesus. Beautiful, beautiful thing. We, we know that it's very likely that uh, Simon's two sons become Christians. Alexander and Rufus are mentioned in Mark chapter 15. Rufus, if it's the same Rufus, is mentioned in Romans chapter 16, uh, who, is, who is connected to the Christian church. So it's believed that Simon perhaps were, was converted to Christianity and then even brought his two sons to Christ as well. But we just can't imagine his life not being changed after that event. Uh, a life-changing event. But then it picks up in verse 33. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. So they came to this place, Golgotha. Traditionally, this is believed to be west of Jerusalem. And we talked about the significance of east and west. Uh, usually when people are being driven away from God, uh, you go to the first part of Genesis, they're usually traveling west. After they ate the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they were put west of, I'm sorry, east of the garden. And then when Cain killed his brother Abel, he was put east in the land of Nod. And they just kept traveling east, east, east. But when Abraham is called, where does he travel? From Ur of the Chaldees, which is west, to east, to come to the land that God had promised. Christ comes from the east, from the Garden of Gethsemane, which was east of Jerusalem, comes into Jerusalem, is tried and wrongly convicted, and then is led west, westward out the gate to Golgotha. But nonetheless, this is where he's taken. And they actually found a place that they suspect is the place where he's crucified. And if you look at it, it actually looks like a skull. Very interesting. Um, but probably why it got its name. I'm sure that's why. And it says they gave him wine to drink mixed with gall. Uh, again, referencing Mark. It says that it was mixed with myrrh. Uh, both of those were symbolic of bitterness. Okay, so the gall was a secretion that comes from the liver, a very bitter thing to put inside a drink. Myrrh was also something, uh, an oil that you could put in there that would make it real bitter. One was probably just figurative. Most likely, maybe Matthews was figurative. Who knows? But the main point is that he was given a bitter drink. And commentators suspect that this was to deaden the pain. Kind of like a woman who's going into childbearing, who, uh, or childbirth, who gets an epidural, uh, just to kind of deaden the pain. Well, Jesus tastes it, and he says, no. I'm going to take on the full suffering. I'm going to feel the full effects of sin on my body as I suffer to the utmost. No relief, nothing I'm bringing in to bring comfort. I have to taste it fully. I'm not going to taste this cup. I got to taste my father's cup, the one that he said that I had to, I had to drink. And by the way, while we're thinking while we're here, sometimes when you're suffering, when you're bearing the cross for Christ, you might be offered the strong drink, the, the bitter drink, or something to alleviate the pain. Sometimes it's from the Father. Sometimes it's graciously given to our Father. We're suffering, we're going through hardship and difficulty, and the Lord just brings maybe somebody into our lives that just deadens the pain a little bit. Or, or I don't know, maybe He brings us to a passage of scriptures or a song or something that just is like balm to our soul, that just kind of comforts us and helps us to keep going a, a little longer. And that's a beautiful thing and a wonderful thing that we should just take in as, as a gracious gift from our Father, something to help us along in His grace. But let's face it too, there's an enemy out there that wants to give us the bitter drink. Here in this particular situation, this strong drink mixed with gold would have been opposing his father's will. The will of the father was that he would take on the full suffering, the full pain that sin caused. Had he drunken this cup, 
he would have been at odds with his father. He would have sinned against his father. So he wasn't going to do that. And oftentimes, Satan comes to us to offer us things contrary to God's will in the moment of agony and distress, because that's when we are most susceptible to do what we should not do, to go against our Father's will. Oh, Joey, look how hard you're suffering. Just give in to this temptation, or, you know what, don't, don't stand up for Jesus in this particular situation. Look out for yourself a little bit. Or stop following after, you know, doing that good work. It's causing you too much heartache. Why don't you just kind of back off a little bit? Why don't you get a little bit of comfort? Why don't you step away outside of the Father's will just for yourself, to protect yourself or to make yourself feel better? Be very careful when you're offered an opportunity for comfort in the time of suffering. If it leads, if it's something good and wholesome, it very well could be from the Father. But if it's something that's leading you away from what you clearly know you should be doing, oftentimes it could be from the enemy. Just be very careful what cups you're given in the time of suffering. All right, picking up in verse 35. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among themselves by casting lots. So here, the only thing that Jesus owns anymore, perhaps, is what's on his back. You ever hear someone say, yeah, that person would give you the shirt off their back? Jesus literally did that. He gave the shirt off his back, his garment. Again, exposed, going back to the garden, eating of the tree, expose the flesh and nakedness christ is taking that on as he's uh, hanging on the cross they take his garment and cast lots for it there's more detail on that in john and in a few weeks when we get to john we'll cover that i'm kidding it'll probably be a lot longer than that but when we get to the gospel of john he breaks down more of this um, we get more idea of the outer garment the inner garment we'll save it for that study but suffice it to say right here he's being stripped of the very the only thing that he owns and some suspect that this might have been a garment that was sewn by his own mother, uh, which wouldn't have been uncommon in that day. Um, so it might have been something very precious to him, something very sentimental, but it was taken away from him at this particular moment. In verse 36, it says, And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. So the soldiers, they take their gar his garment, they're casting lots, they're making sport of what's going on, and then they just sit there and watch him suffer. And I'll guarantee you that as you take up your cross, as you live the crucified life, as you go through sufferings and hardships, maybe sometimes even wrongly, we feel, I guarantee you there's people sitting and watching. They're watching you and your suffering. They're watching you and how you respond. You may not, you may not think they are. Matter of fact, when we're in the darkness and the trial, Oftentimes, we, we're just so focused on what's going on, we don't even know who's watching, uh, may not even care who's watching, but there are people watching us, and that's very important. It could be our children, it could be our grandchildren, it could be our coworkers, whoever it might be, fellow church members who might be inspired by the way that you're dealing with it, or, or the opposite. People are watching us. They're watching us as we bear the cross for Christ, just as these soldiers are watching Jesus suffer on the cross. Verse 37, and above his head, they put up the charge against him, which read, this is Jesus, King of the Jews. Beautiful way Matthew ties everything up in a, in a bow. Like bookends to his story. What are we introduced with in Matthew chapter 2? The Magi, right? Coming from the east. He said, where is he? The King of the Jews. For we saw his star in the east. They come to Herod, who had taken upon himself the title King of the Jews, coming to him boldly and saying, where is the true king of the Jews is in essence what they're saying. Where is the king of the Jews? And there's that whole scenario where Herod gets angry. He has the babies killed there in Bethlehem and, and everything that goes on with that. Matthew starts with this whole idea of stirring up this idea of the king of the Jews. And then here at the end of his story, he's doing the same thing. Again, provoking the Jews by having this king of the Jews written uh, above Jesus' head. And again, John chapter 19 gives more detail We'll talk about it in more detail then. Very significant that it was in different languages. But uh, again, we'll, we'll talk about that later. But still, this is what he put above him. I mean, we know that Pilate said, or they came to Pilate and said, hey, don't put on there, this is the king of the Jews, but that he said he was king of the Jews. And Pilate says, nah, what I have written, I have written. 
and it, it, and it remained there appropriately there because Jesus was the king of the Jews. Verse 38, at that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. Uh, fulfilling Isaiah 53, he was numbered with the transgressors, um, put there with robbers. In verse 39, and those passing by were hurling abuse at him, wagging their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. Again, we get tied to the early part of the book of Matthew. What was, what, in those first two temptations in the wilderness that Jesus underwent, what was it that Satan said to him? If you are the Son of God, take these stones and turn them into bread. If you are the Son of God, stand up on the pinnacle of the temple and jump down and show me that the angels would bear you up lest you dash your foot against the stone. If you are the Son of Man, Interesting that these people are saying the same things that Satan did to try to tempt Jesus in Matthew chapter 4. They're saying it now. They're saying, if you are the Son of Man, come down from the cross. And it's also similar to what Satan was doing, right? Remember what Satan was trying to do was to get Jesus off of the pathway of what the Father had for him? After those first two temptations, then he shows them all the nations and says, all these I will give to you if you bow down and worship me. In other words, bypass the cross, bypass the sufferings. I'm going to give you what your father promised, but I'm going to give it to you right now. Here, they're also trying to get Jesus to bypass the cross, to come down from the cross, to immediately put to silence the suffering and to put an end to the trials that he was undergoing. So Jesus was being tempted even while on the cross. And I would say that when we are on the cross, suffering for Christ or suffering for some other reason, that's when temptation is most likely going to come. And that's when we'll be most susceptible to temptation. Come down from the cross. Don't bury your cross and follow after Jesus. Put it to the side. It's too burdensome. It's too difficult. Find yourself a little bit of relief. Walk away from Jesus. Come after the world. It has more to offer. That's what Satan wants to tell us. If you're really children of God, why are you suffering like that? Why is God allowing you to go through that? Verse 42, I'm sorry, verse uh, 41, it says, In the same way the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Very interesting phraseology they use there. It says, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Wrong. He saved others, but he would not save himself. Isn't that amazing? A person who was just concerned with saving others and would not save himself, had the power to do it, had the ability to do it, could have very easily done it, but didn't save himself. He was here for the salvation of others, to save mankind from their sin and their guilt and their condemnation. He was not, he was not there to save himself. Ironically, he was there to save others. But they missed that. They didn't realize that he was there willingly and obediently and lovingly. It says, he is king of Israel. He is the king of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. If he delights in him, for he said, I am the son of God. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. Okay, so this brings us back to what we were talking about earlier, right? When he was in the center of this uh, cohort, and they're all, Roman cohort, and they're all, you know, casting insults and beating him and spitting on him. And he's trusting in the Lord this whole time, making his face like flint. His heels dug in. I'm staying where I'm, I'm staying put. This is where my father wants me. I'm trusting in him. Well, there will be some, when you make statements like that, who will mock, they'll mock you and say, Oh, he or she trusts in God. If God delights in them, why doesn't he save them? Let God rescue them, they would say. They look at you obediently following the Father, but suffering because of that obedience and thinking, he's trusting in the Lord. He says that God delights in him, but look what God's allowing him or her to go through. And they even claim to be children of God. He says, he said, I am the son of God. We claim to be children of God. First 
uh, John chapter 3, Oh, what wonderful love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the children of God. And such we are. And we do call ourselves the children of God. So you're trusting in the Lord. You say God delights in you. You say that you're children of God. Why doesn't he rescue you? That's the big question. That's what they're mocking. Many will mock us in those similar situations. But perhaps worse than that is we begin to make those statements about ourselves. I've been trusting in the Lord day after day, week after week, month after month, maybe for years. I'm still dealing with the same affliction, the same trial. And I've been putting my trust in the Lord. I know the Lord delights in me. Why doesn't he rescue me? Why doesn't he pull me out of this situation? Jesus gives us an example. That sometimes, even though we trust in the Lord and that God, we know that God delights in us, remember this is God's beloved Son, doesn't give us um, a free ticket out of suffering. And it doesn't mean God's just going to always just pluck us out of trials. Sometimes He's got to leave us there for the greater good. And that's what's going on here. Jesus had to go through the full suffering. He had to go all the way to death, through death, in order to procure justification and righteousness and salvation and eternal life for those who put his trust in him. There was a greater good that was being accomplished, so Jesus needed to stay in the fire. And the same thing is true with us. We might lose heart. I've been trusting in the Lord. I know the Lord loves me, but he hasn't rescued me. Take heart. He's doing something good. He's working something out. Remember Romans chapter 8. Well, we know that God causes all things to work together for good for those who love him. He's working out something good. It might be something good in your life. It might be something good in someone else's life. It might be something good uh, for a whole host of people, as was the case with Jesus. But just keep on trusting. Don't give up just because you haven't been rescued yet. Stay there. And it says even the robbers uh, were, who were crucified with him were insulting him with the same words. So he's getting it from all sides he's getting it from the chief priests and the elders he's getting it from the romans he's getting it from people who are crucified with him uh, just uh, through and through thoroughly uh being mocked here in this situation so that basically closes the first three hours of jesus's crucifixion and lord willing next week we'll get into what happens in the sixth hour which is around noontime 12 o'clock in our the way that we render time and, we'll, and then we'll follow through and continue this study of the crucifixion of Christ. But for now, we'll, we'll end the study. And just to say that, you know, if, if you find yourself, you know, trying to consider, should I follow Jesus? Should I not follow Jesus? Maybe you foresee that if I do follow Jesus, it's going to mean some difficulty in my life. I might be rejected, mocked, mistreated. Just know that if you'll just trust him, trust the process, Dedicate yourself to him, obediently follow him, he will bring you through. On the other end of the cross, at the other end of all this suffering for Christ, was resurrection, power, glory, sitting at the right hand of the Father. Yes, it's a difficult process, but it's a wonderful result. And that's what we offer you here this morning. If you are hindered from coming to the Lord because of what it might mean for your life, yeah, temporarily, Maybe immediately you might find some hardship, but boy, it's worth it in the end. Eternal life, resurrection life, eternal life with the Father. Uh, the new heavens and new earth described in Revelation 21 where there is no more suffering, crying, pain, sickness. That's waiting for us, but there's a process. We've got to trust the process. So if you want to join us in following the Lord and taking up your cross to follow Him, please come forward as we stand and sing the song that JT has prepared. <laughs>